So now sound check. Quite working? Good. Okay. So thanks again. And uh, welcome to the talk Lisa Insights enabling Linux in safety applications. Uh, so it's already in the know where the acronym stands for. My name is uh, Philip Amon. I'm working for Bosch and I'm also TSC member of the ELISA project. I'm leading the automotive and systems work group there and you'll be guided through the project in the next half an hour to see the insights of the different work groups, how they interact and uh, which use cases we address. But first of all, uh, yeah, as we talk about Linux and safety critical systems, it's important to understand uh, the safety of a system sufficiently. And basically, it's not only safety. Whenever you do a product, you should have a decent, good understanding of the system. And when you understand the system, you also need this context of the system and which role the Linux actually plays in. And you will soon figure out that Linux, I mean, you, you all know it, that Linux is quite a bunch of lines of codes and a lot of elements, subsystems in there. So you need to see if you want to go into safety or maybe go for security, you need to look into which components are actually relevant, uh, what are the pain points, where you need to get in, which features can support argumentation. And um, yeah, then if you look into safety standards, there's also more. There's um, documentation, processes, requirements, traceability through the whole stack. And also this is something where you need to identify where gaps come in. If you compare Linux to a traditional um, safety critical OS, you know that they normally come with hard real-time capabilities. We know that pre are patches are in the kernel these days, but well, some people say hard real-time you only achieve when you do it bare metal. And what the commercial OS also typically bring is that they have a proven safety compliant development process. If these systems are now let out to the world of complex multi-core, multi-level cache processors, they don't look that good anymore in many fields. Um, especially if you just do a direct benchmark compared to Linux because there's an enormous development ecosystem. We know how security is handled. There, of course, there are vulnerabilities, but there's a lot of people fixing it. Um, yes, yeah, at the multi-core support and the sh real large amount unmatched hardware support, which you have, right? You find so many devices where you can just put Linux on, try it with your favorite uh, commercial autos and ask them if it already has a board support. Most likely wait quite some time. And what I really favor also is that Linux brings a lot of expertise in security, in development, whatever. If you have a network drive, you have so many maintainers and so many good networks relationships so that you can just ask people for it. And this gets much smaller if you come to the commercial side. So for this, um, Elida has now started to take the mission and look for certain elements, processes, tools, which can be used in Linux-based safety critical systems and yeah, bring them and make them amenable to safety certification, right? So that's at the end where we want to go to. And um, yeah, the scope basically reflects this as well. So it's a lot of software development tools, processes. Also documentation is very important. I guess it's something which pops up in many other talks as well. And by this, we hope that a lot of others are enabled from the perspective of goals, right? We, they look quite similar to the mission, um, but it's really the enablement of companies and integrators to build up systems and um, to see that the work, what we are doing, will also be accepted from the open source community, especially if we want to change processes or add <coughs> testing things, so put a little higher burden on some things which may be needed for safety, but also get the safety community awareness uh, what all has been established in open source and what Linux can do or not can do and your yeah, regulations, standardization, they go in a similar direction then. Right, and for this we look how we can have a reference system which then can also be put to safety and integrity standards so that you can have a good fit on this. So, uh, yeah, I guess that uh, a path forward is needing to close also all the gaps we have and to understand which risks are in Linux-based systems and how we can tackle them. And we need to understand the Linux safety criticality system elements in here. Right. So uh, it has to be said 
that we cannot do certain things. Um, we will not be able from ELISA to engineer your system to be safe because this would mean we would know your use case, we know your environment, everything around it, so we simply cannot do this and cannot prepare an out-of-the-box safe Linux. And if we provide tools, it's also in responsibility of you to use and understand the methodology and the processes behind it. And I guess it's also quite normal for a lot of other things which you're doing. If you don't understand what you do, there's a high risk that something fails. And this is very, very critical and essential for safety that you get the full understanding. And there have been attempts in the past, and this question comes up quite often, will you create an out-of-tree module then, which is just having all the elements and it's safe? But uh, you know how many fixes get in, patches get in into a kernel, and well, you then still need updates in there continuously. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to certify just a certain version. Long, I heard once a story, I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, that there was the attempt to certify a 2.4 kernel, and they made a long, long way forward, even if there were not the standards as such available. And at the time where they came to the point that, yeah, we have safe kernel, 2.6 came out, and all their business case was gone. So, uh, yeah. so there's a lot of responsibility at your hand as well. But what we can do, we can tackle this together because the demands are very similar. And for this, we gained a good momentum from a lot of partners. So we have ELISA members from uh, various different business areas, from groups. We have recently also Boeing from Aerospace joining, which is a nice thing. We have Automotive, which is strong, and also uh, good support from the Linux community. Right. We have some associate members also with university partners and industry partners, which are not listed here like UL, OZADL, and the Civil Infrastructure Platform Project, which basically sent the message, we support you in whatever you do. Yeah, From a technical strategy, um, the ELISA basically tries to get deliveries mainly focused on the Linux kernel. For now, we know there's much more. If you read, read the technical white paper, which is available on the web page, um, you will also find that glibc, for example, is mentioned as a crucial element, and we need to go up the path. But in the end, whatever you write needs to path the kernel and get down into the system. So for this, we currently look into these elements and see what system integrators can use and of these deliverables. Yeah, in this way, the different working groups settle together. Uh, the use cases, automotive and medical, they drive the whole activities. They provide insights, ideas, demands. And then we have elements where safety architecture looks a lot into the kernel parts and we have an engineering process which actually more than just the processes around it's also provide tooling methodologies when you analyze things uh, the system theoretic process analysis comes in there it's a new hazard and risk analysis technology and yeah Linux features for example is also something where it's really on elements very specific features which will help you in an argumentation for safety in the kernel without saying if you have this feature it's safe but it just tells you more about the do's and don'ts. And this then gets into um, a systems work group fed in there, which basically tries to couple a reference system out of it. Right. Yeah, the white paper is there. Um, it summarizes and gives some more insights of what I've just presented. And all this work, which is in there, is going through a TSC. Uh, I guess it's typical that you have a technical steering committee. What I want to mention that it's really open as such. We meet every second. Wednesday and um, you can simply join you can bring in ideas and what we also have that you don't need to be a member to become a TSC member so we have really community members which just made it as TSC members and we make also sure that the things get together so some recent activities was to yeah, align that we come to a more common set that you if you go to one GitHub repo of the one work group, that it looks similar to another GitHub repo, that we have similar documentation available and follow a certain style that we use the same rules. A lot of things which are just processes which are important anyway for safety. And yeah, we plan workshops around this. We have one in Manchester in person next week. And um, also the approval of new work groups is important. Talking about work groups, uh, you've seen the small icons in there. We have uh, safety architecture work group which really looks into Linux subsystems and see which components are supporting safety whereas safety related functionality, non-safety related functionality, for example looking into watchdog, 
how does the watchdog support things, how is memory management done or other elements in here. And also they took the automotive use case of telltales, which is basically warning signs in cars um, at the first approach to look into what is really affected in the kernel. Right. From the Linux features, uh, this is really the feature part. Similar, if you think about security, you know that you can have C groups, namespaces, all these kind of things, which are typical elements which you have in security. And the Linux features subgroup or working group also check that how can you do things? What is important for memory management, fault handling? Is there something what you should do in kernel configuration or which you should avoid? And being, giving bits and pieces. And I think that's very crucial for the whole thing because it gets you closer to something which you can experience earlier rather than waiting years for a certification or waiting years for something else to be visible because sometimes or often safety just takes some time. And this should help also others to directly experience something. Right. Uh, for the work group itself, for the Linux features, it's also that they look for a good support. They're really open to get more insights. And I don't know, is there anyone here who brings a lot of safety experience from the past or Linux kernel experience? Then it's nice to just hear and say, well, here I know this maybe from security or from another perspective. I've used this in the company to just get in safety elements. And it's really the also request to just look into this and see how we can get elements right. And uh, yeah, I think we had this also on the first page a little bit. There's a certain example which features can be used and we want to demonstrate this by a reference so we can see, okay, here's something to check out and look at. It could be memory protection or fault handling, other parts. And um, right. This Linux features was a split of a former uh, development process work group and we have a second step or second path in there, which is the open source engineering process as such. Within this, um, there is an idea to identify processes, techniques to apply safety engineering principles. And we see here strong interaction is also done with other work groups. So a lot of SDPA analysis, which we use to analyze module systems, subsystems coming here. They're supporting this a lot and bring also the tools along with it. And the approach is that um, they you select a certain Linux topic or feature, and this is typically done in the cooperation with other work groups. You um, then conduct safety studies for this selected topic to answer question like what are the risks in there, uh, how the risks are addressed, how we can reduce the risk, what could go wrong, and so on. And by this, really, the formal techniques help to visualize these elements. And then they also try to see that we have uh, a real good process around it, that all work groups act in a similar way, which you can then also use in your company to proceed. And um, then also from tooling perspective, because not only the Linux part, it's also the tools which are used to create your Linux system, right? There's also something that goes along there and uh, yeah, use a similar methodology both in, in both ways to analyze your things and to improve how, where do you need to test what's and also work is published then in the GitHub repo, right? A smaller group, which calls themselves the fun group, uh, in the end they said it's, this, it's one of the smallest in Elisa, but um, they set up um, CodeChecker, they set up Syscaler, and um, they look really in improving getting kernel patches also back. So it's a general help for any project to do these bug fixes and it helps the overall um, quality of the kernel. What they also help, they bring experience because we have a lot of people who never submitted a patch or worked with kernel maintainers. And for this, they also, whenever there's someone who would like to learn how things are, then they come into get game and uh, say, here's a way around it. How, that's how you do up. And they also work on a lot of documentation cleanup because documentation is also important. All right. This is on the, like I would say, surrounding parts. And I will jump over to the use cases. Uh, the first use case is the medical devices working group, which uses open APS. Uh, this is an open source insulin pump. I have it on the next slide, just so something about the project. It's very interesting to see that this was born as open source. So basically some of the hardware elements became, uh, had an open interface, had open hardware interfaces, and by this you could steer 
this insulin pump wire, wire signals if you have a dongle uh, with your Raspberry Pi. So what they did, they set up Raspberry N, they write some scripting which checks values, put some measures in there that you're not simply take, like re reading multiple values from your uh, glucose level in the blood and then decide what you do. And it's for diabetes type 1 uh, affected person and by this you get a much better quality of life, like you don't have to wake up at night to do an insulin dose or so because you have a Raspberry Pi monitoring it. And the really interesting part about it is that it's, uh, yeah, it's done by open source development by engineers, by software engineers, and it was not directly from a company or such, and it was not, it's developed with safety in mind, right, increasing the quality of the people and make your life more safe because still the Raspberry Pi does to a lot of a better job to the, to the analytics than what you can do on your own. But it's not like a, you took any IEC standard or so in this. And here the medical devices work group, it really looks at it from a approach. They see how do we bring in what is the S from the SDPA, SDPA analysis, what does it mean for certain safety standards, like how do we handle Linux as software of unknown provenance and check what could go wrong and actively discuss with the community. So I see this is really a value. Uh, I believe the automotive world is much larger than the medical and you also don't have the selling point in there, so it's more the way forward, but really this analysis makes it different and settles down the base, what the people experience already know, that they trust a Linux device, even if it's not certified, and they say, I trust this Raspberry Pi with the scripting on top to monitor my glucose level and go forward. So this is what I really like. Um, you can go to the Open APS webpage and just, uh, so if you search in Google for Open APS, you'll find the things around. And we handled this actually from the first workshop. And it was really nice, and because it's open, it's, there's no NDA. There's uh, a community willing to engage with you and explain things, starting and all of this and so on. And by this, there's a good way forward. Uh, maybe a little bit in contrast to what you sometimes experience in automotive. Um, just one comment if I can. Okay, hi, I'm the co-speaker. I'm not sure oh, if it's on. It's on. Put it on. It's, no, it's on. Hello? Yeah. Okay, hi. I think that example is an important example and it's part of it. Uh, I want to focus more on what you mentioned already about bridging the gap here, okay? We're coming from two different ends, safety standards, stringent requirements, development processes which are not at all aligned with how Linux is developed, and on the other hand, coming from the bottom up with what we know, the power, the features, what Linux can do and where we can bring Linux and bridging that gap, okay? I'm just emphasizing that point here, and it's also an invitation, and Philip will get to that again at the end, but I'm um, planting some seeds in people's mind. People who can contribute are willing to help to bridge that gap, to bring together elements from both sides, and to come up with practical, realistic solutions. Um, that's what this is all about, okay? Thanks. Right. I think it's still on. I don't know to which mic I will go now. Okay, great. Good, it's lowered then. Uh, I jumped into the automotive, so I'm actually the lead of the automotive work group, I said during the beginning. Um, we were checking which use case we'll tackle, and there was the AGL guys which brought in the telltale use case. Uh, telltale, typically, if I say nobody knows what it is, but simply speaking, it's dashboard warning signs. So it's um, the gear indicator, the oil check engine, the oil pressure, or oil temperature things which come in. And why it's an interesting use case is that you see already there's a lot of spread of Linux in automotive overall, maybe more for infotainment, also in the cluster part. But there's still the demand for a safety operating system for monitoring and creating these telltale parts. So it would be nice to just get over it. But it's not the only driver, it's, um, it's something that I can easily explain to you, right? So it's, if I, Say you have a car, you have a dashboard, here's the icon, we're talking about this, and it has a certain safety functionality because if it, something goes wrong with your brake and you're not informed, well, bad luck. And also the nice thing is that we don't need to set up something with complex sensors, actuators, and so on. So it's easy to more easy to understand, but it still represents the basic 
challenges for more complex use cases and um, when what comes else on benefits is that we have limited subsystems and components compared to a complex autonomous driving use case for example. Um, we have the very relaxed timing constraints which means uh, we don't need to look in the first shot into the RT Linux patches and see how they are involved in there. We can rely on something like 200 milliseconds of until half a second of response time and uh, yeah, and it's good to visualize and explain to others. <coughs> Still, it provides a path forward because the architecture, if you think about someone requesting, like the brake request to send a telltale, it could also be your park distance control, which just uh, sends a signal. And then you would rather having a display, but having a speaker. And you're almost in the same use case. So from the architectural diagram, and that's why you can already cover similar use cases. And then, also with a rear view camera or surround view parking control, there you have again the sensor data which you need to process and then you display, you have an easy way of having a safe state. Safe state means like the functionality stop, right? And you can just be in a <laughs> safe state. And this could be turning off the display, for example. If you turn off the display, you will know something is wrong here. And if you have a surround view for your camera and then you turn off the display, then you would not look at the surround view anymore, <coughs> but you directly look to the outside and we have a good state for this. And then this brings us into a path forward for autonomous driving. And what we figured out that the architecture, how we currently look at, it's really, um, here, it's a pure Linux. By intention, we left things out like containers or virtualization. We just throw them beside because we said, maybe in later architecture will look like this in real life but it just adds additional layers for analysis, analysis for our use case and we want to see what elements are going into the Linux part. But as an enhancement of this, we come with the systems workgroup, which was dealing with an architecture which we see in multiple areas. So it's like uh, if you go for industrial where you have also an RTOS next to a Linux system, if you go for medical device where you control certain data but have HMIs, aerospace also has some Linux elements in there and so we said we need to come closer because when we reach a point and we say what we did is a good start let's try it out then someone say hey here comes reality our architecture looks much different so we are no longer there and therefore we try to get a reproducible reference system we also try to reach out to other communities which have safety relevance in there and interact then with projects which doing a job there. Um, and practices mean that we started with uh, hypervisor and RTOS and RT Linux. S uh, this was done by, uh, by the Xen Pro or by Stefano Stavolini from Xen Project. And this we have done as a showcase for the Open Source Summit in North America. But this was mainly manual, illustrating a lot of capabilities which Xen has. And we use this as a base to bring this forward into a proper use case and getting this architecture fully automated so that you um, really would just check out something and build your whole system with it but also add the documentation because you may not use Zephyr as an Artos or you may not use Xen as your relevant uh, hypervisor. You want to replace maybe your AGL distro with an Apertus distro which we are doing in Bosch or take another Linux cell if you're leaving the automotive area, right? So then you would like to see these kind of things and we try to get into an oper interoperability state that you can just plug things out and in, but uh, still get things together and maybe create even a full, automate, fully, I would say, compliant SBOM, right? If you do a software bill of material generation out of your whole system stack, which is also not that easy these days. You would put all things together and say I have built an element here, I've built something there and now I still need glue logic to get all my binaries and images to the target to get all the compliance reports and so on. And actually out of this activity in the systems work group there is currently a spin-off group. We started the discussion in the systems work group, figure out it's not the best forum to discuss there and there is now a special interest group for functional safety within the SPDX project. So they started a few weeks back, they meet on Fridays, there's a mailing list for this and this was one activity which just came out of Elisa and we fought a better forum there and have nice participants from other industries as well and bring it better directly into SPDX. Um, 
Right. Then uh, I said we have a strong interaction. We have uh, currently already worked with the Xen project and the Zephyr project in the systems work group. We try to extend this, uh, especially for the Zephyr part, because we were mainly using it, but not really having strong community support. We have people in there, but not from a technical, more from the safety perspective. And um, we also see that we promote and explain our use cases more in their community and ask them to support us. We're already in interaction with the Automotive Great Linux for the Automotive Workgroup, but also they have an interest in bringing their different demos, which have a split architecture for a cluster and for infotainment to one setup where you then have two Linux cells and an RTOS next to it, which is there for fa safety functionality for now. We see that the architectures which have shown are repeating with what's also an SDV project, the Software Defined Vehicle in Eclipse have. The SOFI architecture also has a lot of these elements. And well, I had a discussion like at the beginning of the week explaining this and I found it quite nice. I said, well, yeah, this architecture diagram reminds me what I've drawn six years ago. And I guess, yes, it's still something relevant and it's still all over there. And especially as the devices get connected and there's so much more and you have much more things to consider, the architectures just start looking like this. And here. Yeah. I want to conclude on the systems work group part with the uh, quote from, from George Bernard Shaw, which I really like. If you have one apple and you exchange one apple with another one, both of you have still one apple. But if you exchange one idea with another one and both exchange an idea, then each of you have two ideas. And this is really where the work goes about, about this collaboration. And you say you bring a piece of work which you would like to get into this project or you have ideas then just come and communicate and I guess similar what the work how the aerospace guys from Boeing came in they said there is already something uh, used in avionics it's not that well known and while they were just promoting us last week during our virtual summit there was directly a large chat going on was like well we're doing something for space we are here to we will open a tool and there was really a good feedback on just saying, giving a little push, and then the people come. And this is now under our, our TSC review. So it's, we need to see that we find at least sufficient people who want to support it. Seems to be the easy part. And then you will experience the standard things like mailing list GitHub repo and starting the work. And uh, yeah, basically, this group, as the initial proposal was, should address everything which flies, like. Drones, personal delivery, drones, uh, space, uh, rockets, whatever you can find of uh, standard personal flights, flight flights, avionics. So all these elements should be addressed there. So uh, I would like to uh, really appreciate if there are people coming. And I really like that the room is quite full. There's just a few seats left on this. So uh, I hope we will also be able to enter in discussion and get the one or the other question. Um, we have a lot of knowledge base already. So um, there is a ma different mailing list for all the work groups. You can just subscribe on this. Uh, if you need an entry point for this, I'll show another QR code. So you can just uh, get to the main website of Elisa and then you can go for join or select your, in the member working groups part, select your favorite work group, start joining there, subscribe, figure out the meeting schedules on this so that you really come to a pass where you're not sitting here and just listen, but really can be able to interact and bring your questions, your thoughts, your ideas, your elements, your tools into this discussion and see where it can fit into the leader scope. You want to add a word, Ilana? Good. Yeah. So here's the QR code for scanning. And if you don't want to wait until uh, the whole thing kicks off or run till the next mail comes up. There is a nice BUF session. And I guess I'll need all of you because it's in the auditorium where we had the keynotes. So uh, it starts today at six and will be uh, held by Kate Stewart, SVP who was in the Linux Foundation. She's basically handling a lot of these activities with Zephyr, SPDX, uh, Elisa, of course. I, I for sure missed something. She's got on this embedded track. And Shua Khan, she's currently our TSC chair. She's kernel maintainer and uh, also fellow of the Linux Foundation. So they, they have this. You may find one or the other slide again on this, just for picking the people up in the BUF. But 
that it's a good time to continue the discussion, which maybe start here. And I guess by this we have the half an hour <laughs> filled for the talk time and have a, like five to ten minutes more for questions as you like. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I start over there. Oh yeah, one with the red. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I was wondering, was it a use case spring? Because I'm in, in the energy sector, the explanation energy. Would it be useful to add a different um, use case group, or is it just more of the same? What does the aerospace, for example, add to the existing? Energy? Yeah, the so the question is: Is there some addition when the aerospace joins? Do they bring the new use cases in? Where is the benefits of different use cases? Um, if you just take the safety perspective, of course, there are different standards come in, and you may find standards which are more strict, some are more relaxed. So it gives you a, a migration path that you start with something smaller and have already the understanding. Um, what I heard from aerospace, for example, they say we have this use case, but they cannot go through the authorities and explain why the automotive use case may be similar and having the same problems and then bring this into aerospace or another business. So there it comes in. It's a good set to compare to find repeating elements and gain traction so that also the other work groups see like for the architecture, the tools, how do I, which is needed in these use cases. And um, yeah, that's one thing where different use cases make sense. And actually we see a lot of discussion if even the warning sites for automotive are enough or if we should tackle a more challenging use case in parallel um, just to be more on this autonomous driving, large motion, which is currently going on. Yeah. There was another question two rows behind you. So. Yeah, so I just wanted to see if I grasp what you were saying. So your idea is challenging the somewhat rigid safety certifications by providing references of how somebody else did it. Is that, is that cor correct summary? I'm, I would say it's not seeing by how, so you're asking like um, how or I need to repeat it again. <laughs> I don't fully got it. You're challenging the, 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 the rigid and kind of too slow safety certification processes by providing use cases of how somebody, of oh, somebody uh, else did it. Okay. Did. Yeah, you've seen if, if we challenge the snow <laughs> certification process by uh, exactly. going into the use case. Actually, it's, no, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's, it's not like this. Um, we have the use cases because they are needed to certain safety standards to have this whole story to get all this generated. I guess we have a lot of things to do in convincing authorities and showing how open source, because the open source is so much different from what you would normally expect from safety standard, which starts from you write down your requirements, you write your architecture, you have a model-based design, then you generate your code, then you start the testing part, so you're going the waterfall of the V model. I'll try with the Linux kernel part. It's quite a different way. Also, you need to show that the people bring the competencies and so on. So we look into one element, we look into this, how we can bridge this gap and see how can you argue and how can you give an argumentation. Then we know that there's improvement needed for the kernel parts, so we're improving there with certain tools. And uh, then what I also like from the automotive side, I'm treating it sometimes that I'm going away from any kind of standard. I just say, if I'm making my use case such good that nobody comes and say, well, you know, you missed this and this is not safe, but they, I can say we could use and make use of this whole thing. I'm not sure if we ever achieve this in our group or if I need the support by integrator or a commercial product provider because they're much closer to real architecture, real hardware, real use case. But if you just say this is the concept and you find no flaw in this, why it's not safe, then it's a little bit independent from the overall authorities or so. And we have, uh, you, can, you can grab the mic gap. Gap with the architecture work group lead, so. Hello? No. I think, How do you can you switch on the? Hello? No, it doesn't. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. So, no, yes, so the idea is not, um, <laughs> not to challenge the standard, it's not to adhere to the standard in, a, in, a, in an orthodox way. So it's more trying to find uh, alternative solution and every working group work on its own scope. So for instance, the automotive working group will try to figure out like possible solution more at system level. 
in the architecture working group we may go down inside the kernel in a specific context in the Linux feature for safety working group you know they you know we evaluate different specific techniques so it's more investigating possible tailorings let's put it this way yeah Th that could be effective okay. um, just add on what Gabriel said it's more about collaboration communication evolution we can call it even certainly not challenging okay this is something which will happen with time but it can only happen with what we've been calling bridging the gap, more communication and collaboration and common understanding, okay? And that's really what we're trying to promote. There's okay. another question in the back? Yes. This is a bit of a trap question. Okay, make a trap. It's a trap question. The last five words, safety, which safety documentation. Yeah, documentation. right. So uh, the question is, this, the trap question is, uh, as we were talking about tools, but not much about tool qualification, what the paths in there, how we go forward on this. And um, there are actually already tools in this context. So there is a nice talk from uh, Paul Alvatella, which we had, you can find it on YouTube from one of the last summits, they did the Rafi approach and did tool qualification on elements. And you will also find other tool qualification like for, for Qt, it's not from Elisa, but there is a, this Qt rendering engine. And this was qualified, so qualif safety qualified as a tool qualification. So in this way, there are cert first steps in this. Um, but you need to see when you go into tool qualification, you really need to take the tools which are modifying your source code. like your document uh, reader is not the one which you need to qualify, right? And it's mainly in the rate, the tricky question, maybe the compiler part, for example, how do you get the safety compiler in? Where, how do you bring this in? Because the standard GNU GCC will not be compliant on this and also take some time. So the trickier question is the time frame. Yeah, the time frame, really the time frame on how long this will take for tools, this depends. I mean, you can do certain analysis, you can do the cool qualification and uh, it depends on the which tools you mean. And Let me clarify. Uh, tools was an example, but the intent is for us to put Linux on our Moses for all processing tools and be able to hit, let's say, ACLB. Right. So, so which time it would fit to hit ACLB? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a trap question then, really. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I will answer with a trap, question, uh, trap answer then a little bit. Um, we would have be, we are much faster when you start to contribute to our work. And um, if we see the open culture, which we bring also from the industry, because if we don't need to create tools, if we don't need to do the architectural concept, but simply use what's out there from all the different industries and where industry part would just open their safety architecture, their safety documents, and their tools they're using, then we're very fast. Good. I guess we have one more minute, so if there's a last question from anyone. Oh, one last question in front row. Uh, thank you for very much for the good presentation. Uh, I just wonder, is there a list of things need to be done to get safety enough? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is if there's a list of what needs to be done to get safe Linux. Um, <laughs> there are actually companies which work in the direction. They have good roadmaps, I guess, on their safe Linux strategy. We are preparing also a roadmap on how we proceed in, a, in ELISA. And um, we get this question more often. And we were so much into our working groups that we currently bring them together towards the roadmaps because these are milestones which we need to see. And there's not a de facto just checklist where you can say, if I've done this, this, and this. We're not in this state yet and not preparing it. So it's because we want to enable others and you need to bring a strong safety process, a strong safety experience also in your company to move to Linux and most likely not saying, I've never done something with safety, so I take the Champions League and just start with Linux in it. It's most likely much better if you have already a system where Linux is involved, where you have safety from another domain and that you get more and more responsibility into your Linux system. That's the way how I would say. And then you have a lot of these things in-house, 
but you don't know how it fits to open source and that's where the work groups come into picture. They really bring you things from what can you do for testing, what can you do as third kernel elements, what can you, how can you tailor or find alternatives to the demands which the standard demand and increase the safety of the system and fulfill whatever the standard has. You will last try. I think it's still on. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah. So I also want to add that we, so Elisa, the, it, will, it, it does not, and it will not deliver a safe Linux distribution because indeed, first of all, because of legal liability and, you know, we will not, you know, we cannot make a safety claim, you know, a safety claim can only be done in a specific context. So we deliver tools, ingredients, documentation that can be used by a third party integrator, right? Then indeed the roadmap will, you know, make it more clear, you know, what are these tools, these ingredients, this documentation, but, you know, <coughs> we will not deliver a safe Linux. You know, this is too big here because many people come, you know, and say, ah, okay, when, when will Elisa, they will, when, when, when will we have uh, like a safe Linux from Elisa? No, that, that's not going to happen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's also very hard if you would come like a safety element argumentation, you would need to go for a safety element out of context if you're talking about ISO 26262 language and um, it's always assumed context, so it's much more interacting, interacting with others. Right, that's it. We're over almost two minutes, so sorry for taking longer.